Hello, good afternoon, and welcome everyone to this week's Zoom for Thought. And this week's Zoom for Thought is not special at all. It's not uh, any famous date. This talk will not be related to any famous people. Let us welcome Greg. Who Except for von Neumann. Except for von Neumann. Let us welcome Greg, who will talk to us in a very boring and serious manner about von Neumann. Let's take the week, Greg. Yes. Uh, thank you, Vaki, for the uh, this proper introduction. Um, I think I'm going to stand up. It's a little awkward on the Zoom, but maybe a little better for in person. Uh, Share my slides with you all. Make this full screen. Let's go. Whoa. I don't know how to use uh, I don't know how to use PowerPoint. There we go. All right. I use Beamer too much. I don't use PowerPoint anymore. See, and I have this like nice animation set for you guys. Do you see that? Like, you know, it's very like like <laughs> see. Beamer doesn't have this. Okay. Well. Oh yes. Thank you. Thank you, Buck, for the, the lighting here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. As long as you can hear me. Okay. So, uh, for the rest of the talk, I would please ask you to hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Uh, however, you may ask me to slow down if necessary. Okay. To start us off with some grace, let A be a Hilbert space. Bounded operators here are just what we want to hear. Subalgebras are of von Neumann if we see that they are closed in. Adjoints in WOT. Or if you prefer, SOT. These topologies are weak, but our outlook is not bleak. By commutants are these same thing as these closures. What a ring. Von Neumann's rings are not so thin. They are spanned by projections. Type one, type two, type three are all. This is not a free for all. B of H is our type one. I think type three is not so fun. Actors can't come in all types. They have no ideals with which to gripe. Now type two one factors are not too easy, not too hard, infinite dimensional with a faithful state, tracial. One important construction group algebra is of von Neumann. Take a countable group G and make a Hilbert space with me. L2 of G is group elements and square sum of all combos of them. Operators now come from G in the form of unitaries. UG acts on delta H giving us delta GH. With L of G, you just can't lose. Just by commute, all those U's. Many topics of group theory have von Neumann analogies. We can form tensor products similar to direct products there are also cross products, like semi-direct products. You might construct a wreath product. Remember your group wreath products? And there are even free products. You guessed it, just like free products. 
another thing from group theory with DNA analogy is their space of G modules. So now we take bi modules. A Hilbert space will do all right with M actions on left and right. Well, let's get back to algebras without causing too much fuss. Two of my favorite properties, amenable upper TT. The former is hyperfinite, union of matrices finite. The latter is very rigid, which can help us to get rid of many of its deformations, but I won't give a demonstration. An open question for thee, take some groups, all of them free. Consider L of F of N, is there an isomorphism? In general, it's very hard to tell two of these rings apart. One property I think sublime is one of two one factors prime. This means that in a product tensor, one part is a type one factor. But basically some matrices, which pop up everywhere with ease. One example is L of G with G's hyperbolicity. An easy case for you and me is when G decides to be free. When G is amenable, L of G is far from gold. Not one, not two, not three, not four, but it has infinite tensors. Another case from 2019, take a wreath product, pristine, with a group not amenable, an algebra non trivial, and get a two one factor prime. I think that has been enough, right? To the end, the slide of springs. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so uh, we did it. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Okay, uh, any, any questions? Yes. Can you just remind me of the definition? Hello, what's happening? Oh, yeah, this is a really good question. Um, I think I wrote down most of the definitions on the slides. Yeah. So, uh, the unique finite group of n elements. <laughs> no, so this is the notation for the, uh, the free group with okay. n generators, is what I was going for. Yeah. So, and then what's L? yeah, so this is the, uh, the group algebra, the von Neumann group algebra associated to that group. And so, I mean, we, we did the construction. <laughs> <laughs> I, we went through it kind of fast, so we can, we can go back. Uh, let's see. It was, I just be able to tell by the picture where it is. No. Okay, well, you should just go through it again. And that to explain it. Yeah, okay. That's a, that's, all right, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good plan. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, so we start with a Hilbert space. And sort of our, our starting point is B of H. So B of H are all the bounded operators on a Hilbert space. So if H is, a, is like C, you know, C to the N, right? Complex numbers to the N. These are kind of basic example of a Hilbert space with the inner product. Um, and in that case, B of H is just M and matrices. So that's like your kind of first example. Um, but when H is infinite dimensional, you have to assert this bounded condition because you want continuity. So if you don't have, con so this, this um, operator norm being finite is equivalent to continuity for these operators. And so this allows you to actually do analysis. Otherwise you're just doing 
I don't know, stupid linear algebra. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, so in B of H, there are these two. Um, so there's this topology coming from this operator norm. So this is creatively called the norm topology. Surprise, surprise. Um, but there are, the, there are also these two weak topologies. There's a whole bunch more topologies. But there's this SOT and WOT topologies, which are like pointwise convergence, essentially. So SOT is literally pointwise convergence for the Hilbert space. And WOT is like pointwise with respect to the inner product. So they're, they're very similar topologies, but they're a little bit different. So if one even algebra is closed, is a star sig algebra closed in these weak topologies? Fun fact, we don't need to talk about type theory right now. Uh, I want to get to Tani's question, that's why I feel bad. Okay, so. Um, I mean, if we go through in order. Yeah, you, you yeah. Just, all right, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, yeah. fine, fine, okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. You know, I feel like I already, you know, I'm, it's all, I'm on the come down. I'm not like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard to get back on track. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so there's also this adjoint mapping, which is the, uh, so, T you get you map to T star. And this always this is always this always exists and it's always unique. Um, and this this is it, what is it? The Reese representation of the theorem for Hilbert spaces is what you need to, to prove this. So uh, I and algebras uh, don't understand Hilbert spaces, and so could you tell me Yeah, so the yeah, the case 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 case. Case. in the case of a matrix, this is the uh, conjugate transpose. Being algebras, I understand this. Yes, <laughs> so you take the, the complex conjugate of every element and take the transpose. Yes, this is this will satisfy this condition. Yes, but it works in much more generality, which is nice. Um, so our monomial algebras, they're going to be closed. So they're subalgebras. So you know they're closed under addition, multiplication, um, scalar multiplication. They're going to be closed under this star, so under this adjoint thing, which is really really important actually because. Like operators and their adjoints play really not well together, essentially. Um, and we close it in one of these weak topologies. Um, and there's this theorem that goes all the way back to the start of the theory, which is this bicomitant theorem. So this is due to Murray and von Neumann. And a subalgebra, a star subalgebra, is WT closed if and only if it's SOT closed if and only if it's double commutant is M. So the double commutant is everything that commutes with everything that's an M. Or sorry, everything that commutes everything that commutes everything that's an M. Sorry, because there's two, two levels. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of special types of elements in these operator algebras. So one is a projection. And projections are really nice because they let us kind of go back and forth between algebraic and spatial properties of what's going on. And so this is the algebraic definition. This is what I usually think of. It's just okay, P equals P star equals P squared. So that's somehow not very like spatially enlightening. So what this is, these are, if you think in B of H or in M and FC, these are actually like the projection onto some closed subspace. Like these are orthogonal projections. So this algebraic condition is, that's the same thing as saying it's an orthogonal projection. Yeah. Being an algebraist, I understand the word algebraic, but do not understand the word spatial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, I mean, when I write like, like a condition like this, right, these are just, you know, some operations on the on P, that's that. So, so it's on like, equation that it satisfies. Um, but spatial, we can think about what's happening in the Hilbert space. Like when you are acting on vectors, like what's happening to those vectors. So it's a more geometric or usually called spatial approach. And so oftentimes with arguments, especially arguments where you have to get your hands really dirty, you do need some of both. You need sort of the algebraic and the spatial perspectives. How do you think algebraists understand the concept of both? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
there are, there are type one, type two, and type three one-ohm algebras. And they, so every algebra that's one-ohm algebra decomposes into a direct sum. So type one, direct sum, type two, direct sum, type three. And basically type ones are really nice and fairly easy to understand. Type twos are okay. And type threes are really bad. <laughs> and so I usually study type twos. Is the, so that's sort of the next couple slides they're getting at. So uh, type ones. So right, I'm going to do this actually slightly out of order, but I will get back to this. So a factor is just a, a simple one algebra. So it has no center. And this is equivalent to having no closed two-sided ideals. This is like a very natural property to work with, right? Because, um, right, I mean, you can always push it out by the ideals or actually, um, if you have a two-sided ideal in a von Neumann algebra, it is always the, um, it's, it's always a projection, which is in the center, uh, yeah, times the whole algebra. So it's like a, yeah, what am I, what am I trying to say? Like the ideals are the are direct sum ends, which is basically what happens. Um, yeah, so what happens, for example, like I said we have this type decomposition, so like type one, type two, type three. So really, each of those is an ideal. So if you multiply something in two different direct sum ends, you know, it's like a zero and and zero one. You just the zeros kill everything. So it's kind of like a stupid ideal. It's really what happens. Um, and you can also write any von Neumann algebra as a direct sum of factors. There's like a huge technical caveat here, but it's essentially true. Um, so the type one factors, so I said they're really nice. They're all B of H for some Hilbert space H. Okay. Now, a general type one factor is a bit more general than this. You have to deal with, for example, abelian monomial algebras too, like these L infinity spaces. Um, but somehow it's just combinations of L infinity and B of H is, is all you get for type one. Being algebras, I have no idea what L infinity is. Okay. <laughs> all right, this is getting really picky. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, yeah. Down. Bounded measurable. There we go. Okay. But yeah, that's not meaningful if you don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's also this notion of a. Um, so with this type of composition, there's this notion of a dimension function. And so, type one, basically what happens is that you have your projections are very fine. And so you can decompose your Hilbert, you have you have all the finite rank projections onto whatever Hilbert space you're representing on, kind of locally in that type one bit. So B of H, right, or matrices, like if you take any one-dimensional subspace, like there is a projection onto that one-dimensional subspace, and that just exists, right? You just, you know, take V, V star, I guess is the, is the matrix you need to go onto the subspace generated by V. And so you have like, I don't know, you, have, you can refine everything down to like literally finite dimensional things. Um, type two is a bit weirder. So you can always restrict down, sort of, you can sort of divide into n arbitrarily as, as much as you want. So it's like infinite in that sense. Um, but it actually makes sense to divide by n and like the projections add up properly. And in type three, the projections are absolutely fucked. It's like the, um, I guess sort of the analogy is something like for measure theory is like, Type one is sort of like an atomic probability space. Type two is like a, a semi-finite probability space. So actually still, still sort of works or maybe sigma finite. And type three is like every set is either measure zero or infinity. So it's just absolute garbage. Um, so that's kind of the analogy. Um, okay. Factors. So within type two, there are type two one factors. And type two infinity are just tensor multiples of type 2-1 factors. So, so a type 2-1 factor, one, so I, I mentioned this like weird analogy with measure spaces, but um, sort of the functional way to, or the pragmatic way to think of these things is that they are, they have a, a tracial state on them. And so there's some function that takes the matrices or your operators and gives you a number and it's a trace. So like, you know, trace of x, y is trace of y, x. And it's linear and it's, it takes positive things to positive things, takes one to one. Uh, so, so, it's, so it's a normalized trace. It's like some sort of a, like positive definite form on 
Uh, yes. So actually, that's a really good point that I omitted from this presentation. <laughs> uh, so if you take the, yeah, so the trace will give you a, uh, a sesquilinear form if you take um, like m cross m and x comma y goes to trace of x times bar y. Oh, y star. Y star. Yes, 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 yes. And actually, uh, this gives you a, you know, this gives you an inner product, but it's not complete on M. But you can take the completion of that inner product and get a Hilbert space. And it's like a very natural way to get a Hilbert space out of your tracial one M algebra. So you kind of stumbled upon the, what's called the standard representation right there. That's very nice. Um, what are your two favorite examples? My two favorite examples. Uh, well, my favorite is the one that comes from the group algebras. What are your three favorites? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess the, uh, what do you have to say, the matrix algebras too? So just, it's just literally just the trace of the matrices. Yeah, like one, one, one over n times the trace of the matrix. Yeah, yeah, it's normalized trace. Yeah, so one goes to one. And you can also, on L infinity, you can integrate against the measure. It's also a trace. So, uh, that's not a factor because it's, it has a big center, right? It's abelian. Everything's in the center. So, so I actually don't like that one very much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so every every tracial factor is either matrices or it's infinite dimensional. So we just kind of throw the matrices usually and just say, screw it, do one factor time. Uh, yeah. So oh yeah, these are, uh, this is groupies, but they're all Von, they're von Neumann groupies. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So, all right, now we can answer uh, Tani's question. So, so first, first we take our, our group and we're, we're taking a discrete group. Yeah, I don't know how to, how to deal with topological groups, so don't even ask me. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe after my time. Yeah. All right, so, uh, so for each, for each group element, we have a formal variable, so what I'm calling delta g's. And we're going to say that's the orthogonal basis for a Hilbert space. So you just say, okay, there is some delta g as a formal symbol for each group element. And you just take linear combinations of those and you get a vector space. So well, that's, the, that's the group ring already, basically, right? Um, but then you take L2 completions of this. Um, so basically, instead of taking finite linear combinations, you take square summable linear combinations of the group elements. And the inner product is given by the fact that it's an orthogonal basis. So like delta G inner product delta H is one if and only if G is equal to H and then zero otherwise. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, what's an element of this thing? Like, yeah. Right. So for a finite group, it's just the group ring. Okay, okay. Yeah. For an infinite group, like for the like let's say g is the integers, uh, then you could just have let's say what's the square symbol sequence one one over n is square symbol. Yeah, because when you square it, it's one over n squared, and that's summable. No, no, okay, right. So you you have a delta for each n, you have a delta sub n, right? So you have like you know like delta zero, delta one, delta two, delta three, delta four, delta five. Then you can do like delta zero plus one and a half or plus delta one plus a half delta two plus a third delta three plus a fourth delta four plus a fifth oh. delta five. And that that element, so all the coordinates are square, like if you add the coefficients are square sum, so that's an element of L2G. We're working over C, right? Yes, yes, implicitly, yes, we're working over C. Um, I guess in principle, you could do this over R, but I don't even want to, I don't know, that's gross, that's yeah, really gross. The definition makes sense for uh, R. Yes, 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 yes. Right. Yeah, because this doesn't embody the topology of the group at all. It just yeah, yeah. Yeah. If G is topological, then you want to you want to care about topology on G. Anyway, um okay, so let's skip or two things. So so G, so we have this this L2 of G space, and because we have an orthogonal basis. Right, a basis. We can just say what happens to the basis, and that's going to be sufficient. So, a group element acts on the basis by permuting it in the following way. Right. So the basis is indexed by the group. Right. And so 
a group element will act on the basis by left multiplication by a left shift. I don't know if this is a left shift. <laughs> this motion is left shift, I guess. <laughs> um, so this is the, I guess, left regular representation of the group. Uh, right, so, and then the name for this operator I'm calling u sub g. So u sub g takes delta h to delta gh. Right, so, so u g is some map from L to G to L to G that takes, that permutes the basis. Um, and therefore it is like automatically a unitary. Um, so unitary means the same thing as for matrices. That's so things that U U star is U star U equals one. Um, that's the algebraic condition. I guess the slightly more spatial way, to, I don't know. Another thing is that unitaries have their, their spectrum is on the unit circle. And unitaries are very special. Um, so I said projections generate your von Neumann algebra. That's actually also true for unitaries. They'll also generate as literal spans. So there's actually a trick. You only need four unitaries and a linear combination of them to get any element. Yeah. Aren't all possible over spaces isometrically isomorphic to each other? Well, separable is the word you're looking for. But, but yes, you're right. Yes. So like, is there like, so you can just like define one such thing as like the unitary one-one algebra of operators. No, 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 right. So, but okay, but what's happening here? So the, the Hilbert space is yeah, highly non-unique. What we did, that's that's true. But then we're defining an action of the group on the Hilbert space, and so that that action is like very dependent on what the group is. Okay, so I get you. Or know, potentially very dependent. So I get these UGs, and you're saying that like. If I extend linearly in closure, I'm going to get like all of the unitary operators. In B, of, no, not not in B of L to G, no, 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 no. Uh, and yeah, you get something significantly smaller. Yes. Um, but what, I, what I'm saying is that it makes sense to like you take all these unitaries that you get from from the group, and you take just um, what am I trying to say? Okay, I, I did say kind of, I conflated two things in my previous statement. That's fine. Yeah. So you take, okay, you take all these elements coming from the, the unitary coming from the group, you take their span, you take their uh, weak operator topology closure, and that gives you a bone on algebra, which is significantly smaller than B of L2G. Yeah. 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 So, again, also something that's omitted is that this, um, these L, so this L of G, so I just use the double common number. That's the same thing as the von Neumann algebra generated by that set, by the bicommutant theorem. So it's kind of like a, bit, a little bit sneaky of me to do that, but, um, Right. And uh, the action was a left right representation of the group on its Hilbert space, I guess natural Hilbert space. So it's the left right representation. So you can do the same thing, but acting on the right. And you would get the, again, isomorphic copy of your, well, it's like the opposite algebra. Uh, and it would also live in B of L2G. And then they sort of, they interplay with each other. So it's not, you don't get like literally the same thing. You get sort of two commuting things inside of B of L2G. That's kind of interesting. So, you, so there is also R of G. Um, yeah, well, what was I going to say? Um, right, L of G also comes equipped with a trace, naturally. And the reason we can do this kind of easily is because we have a nice spatial representation of the group. So you define the, the trace of X to be the inner product of X acting on delta E, inner product delta E. And you just check all the properties and this gives you a trace. Um, and yeah, easy identity of the group. Yes. So, something that is um, <coughs> right. So, in the case where uh, G is infinite, right? B of A, like so, bound operators on a Hilbert space can't have a trace, right? Because the trace of you can't like average across infinitely many things is sort of the, the issue. If you just divide by n, you divide by infinity, you get zero. Um, and so. What happens uh, here is that you know it can't be all B of H because it has a trace. For example, 
I mean, even for uh, even for finite groups, you don't get the whole the whole matrices right? because you're always going to have the trivial representation in your left value representation. So there will be like a one dimensional direct sum and, for example, for a finite group. Taking the double commutandos. Oh. Yeah. So the double commutandos, everything that commutes with everything that commutes with all the UGs. And so in particular, all the UGs will do that. But then a whole bunch of other stuff will as well. So like polynomials and all the UGs will, will have that property. Right. So if you have you have a polynomial in the UGs, um, and you take something that commutes with all the UGs, the polynomial must also commute with, with that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's actually a really good example. So L of the integers. So so the group algebra does inherit. So it, right. So it'll be abelian because the group is abelian. Right. Right. Um, and so actually, <laughs> this ends up being isomorphic to just L infinity of the unit interval, or maybe more appropriately, the the torus, the circle. That's maybe the better way to think about it, with like Lebesgue measure. Now, this is like maybe not so easy to think about why this is true. Um, yeah, it's isomorphic. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so, yes, that's, that, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's exactly correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yes. So is there a way to describe like you... Yeah, so we can kind of go through the, right, so, right, okay, so L of the integers, okay, so you make this countable Hilbert space with a basis in indexed by the integers, and then the integer acts on this Hilbert space by shifting the basis by the left or right, the corresponding amount, and that is a unitary operation on that Hilbert space, because you're shifting the base. So it preserves inner products because you're just shifting a basis. Um, and so the all of those unitaries all commute and then you take some kind of closure. Now we can kind of construct this, I guess, a little bit more explicitly um, in the following way. So like, like Chris mentioned, so if you have uh, the functions e to the 2 pi i k, Right, or I guess, or kx, I guess, on the on the circle. Um, what are these acting on? So these are acting on. Um, right, these are acting on <laughs> the L two space on the circle <laughs> by by level, by multiplication, and it's like the. It's a little weird to say, but it's the same. It's the same thing in both cases. And then you can consider, you can say, uh, what are the operators uh, such that when I apply operators on that Hilbert thing? Uh, that's the spectrum to the shifts, meaning apply an operator to a vector shift in, is this operator applied to that vector? Right. So what are all those operators that, that do that communication? And then you have to do that. Meeting. You say, now all of those I just said, yeah. I mean, okay, well, uh, u0 plus u1 okay. will be, yeah. I mean, you can, like, you just add them up, for example, like linear combinations will be in there for, for sure. Okay. And then, um, yeah, but also like many infinite linear combinations because you take some kind of closure at the end. Okay. 
Yeah, we can talk about this more afterwards. We can kind of work it out. Okay. Um, okay, so then there was this part where I run products like eight times in a row, <laughs> very creatively. Um, so there's a the bunch of nice there. Basically, like if you can do something with a group that somehow like makes sense for infinite groups, you should be able to do it for one I'm in algebra. This is sort of a philosophy in my subfield. <laughs> a pretty pretty significant philosophy actually. So you can the most straightforward thing is that you can take tensor products. And there's a caveat here. So this is not the, not quite the same thing as like in you know in math 200 you learn what a tensor product is for rings or modules or whatever. Um, so that's an algebraic tensor product. But if you just do the algebraic tensor product of two, um, I guess even just generally what two like Bonnock spaces more generally. You don't get something that's closed at the end or complete at the end. So you have to take some kind of analytic completion. Um, so I don't know if people want to, yeah. So there's like a natural way to complete this thing for it to make sense. Um, but it's a nice that's theorem. A that, yeah, Sam. Um, so you said that the thing breaks up as a direct sum of like these factors that are of type one, two, or three. And I, I think it's related to this. So is it like an algebraic direct sum or is it one of these kind of like analytic constructions, like a direct integral or something like that? Yeah, so there, I think there's two things there. So for the type decomposition to the three types. Oh, should I, I should repeat the question? Yeah. yeah. So so Finn was asking about, so there, there was the type decomposition to three types. And I also mentioned that, uh, that algebras decompose into factors. And I used the word direct sum for both of these, which was not quite true. And he's also asking about whether this is a algebraic direct sum as opposed to a um, analytic direct sum of some sort. So that's a really so good question. So when you see a finite direct sum, that is just a normal direct sum. There's like nothing special going on. Um, so the type decomposition into type one, two, and three, that is just literally a normal direct sum. It's the same thing. Um, with the decomposition into factors, this is actually a direct integral. So that's the, yeah. So it is actually scarier than a normal direct sum. Yes. Um, yeah. Now, the other thing is that, you, that you're generally allowed to do is you're allowed to take infinite direct sums. Um, and then there's some sort of L2 completion that's going on in the background there. Okay, so the, 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 the type factors are like simple in some sense, like they're like, and you're saying that that decomposition is algebraic. So you just end up with a, a, a direct sum, a finite direct sum of these, these simple, um, well, not even algebraic. No, okay, this is slightly, okay, this is slightly backwards. So the, you have, there are things of each type that aren't factors. So like type is, is above factor. And then within each type, you can decompose something into, into factors. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So the type decomposition is just a literal, very like straightforward direct sum in thing. And then within each piece, you make a big direct integral out of factors. Yeah, um, yeah. And this is not something that people really use theoretically that often because it's ass. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, good, it's good to know that it exists. Uh, yeah, so anyway, so tensor factors are sort of categorically analogous to direct products. Um, there are also these cross products and kind of a funny story is that I learned what a, like a C star cross product is before I even learned what a group semi direct product is. So this analogy is like backwards in my mind, but, um, <laughs> like fuck the semi direct product. All my homies hate the semi direct product. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, where, uh, in gray research area, like you said, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to think, I have a, I have a property in group theory, and and um, uh, Von algebras are like uh, operator theoretic groups. So I should find yeah. a way to phrase the group theory thing in operator theory. The product of groups went through the tensor product, means that the association is contravariant. So, sorry, covariant. Um, yeah. Uh, and so when you should you have to flip everything when you think how the group thing works. Versus having algorithms. So actually, I go through the exact same philosophy thing where I think 
how does it work in metric theory versus in theory? And then I have to phrase it. Wait, like covariance? Or I mean, the same, the same area. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, it's 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 more more covariant than concentrated. <laughs> I would say. I mean, it's not even really a functor in like the correct sense because like the quotients won't work properly, for example. So. Um, well, wait, I've been using the map. I'm not switching groups and use the map the same way. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's that's, def that's definitely true for like uh, mon monics. But I, I'm a little hesitant to say that for a general map. So. What do you mean by monic? Oh, injective maps. Yeah. Uh, yeah I was just flexing, but I know what monic means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, epic and monic. There we go. There's, there's at least one book that says that. Okay. So. <laughs> um, yeah. So, no, but box is exactly right. So, like, it's it's not so much that I'm actually doing a categorical equivalence in my mind, but it's sort of like. This this thing I know is true for groups, so it must be true for fundamental algebras. And you have to kind of build up your intuition of like what properties carry over and what what doesn't. So, but we have all these constructions which are kind of similar. So it's direct products and dense products. Um, Semi-dark products have an analog, which is a little bit different, which I think trips up sometimes when I talk to people who actually work with semi-direct products. <laughs> but there's anyway, but you have a group that sort of twists in algebra, which then embeds into the, the bigger space. Um, so like M here is sort of like the normal subgroup and G is like the, the acting subgroup. Um, although this is actually a bit more dynamical than group theoretical, you could really argue. Uh, wreath products, which are just a specific type of um, cross product. So where you have some, some space and the group acts on, you, you tensor the space by itself indexed by the group and then the group produces the tensor coordinates. And that's the action that you generate the cross product of. Let's call it a wreath product. So for a group, what you can do, right? So you have two groups, just any two groups. You can take uh, one of those two groups and I guess what, direct sum it with itself, indexed by the second group. And that group acts on this guy by shifting the coordinates. And you can form a semi-direct product. And that's called a wreath product. So for example, uh, if you do the wreath product of I think, Z mod 2Z and Z, then you get the isometries on the real line. <laughs> this is the, it's, it's D infinity is the, is the group. Yes, 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 that's right, yeah. It's called a wreath product because it, it's like a printing computer where you can like rotate it and then you can swap ordinates. And like the yeah. rotation is supposed to be like the action on the coordinates. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, can, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, and they're also free products, um, which, which also makes sense for groups, which is, which is good. Um, you also do amalgamated free products. So you can do a free product where there's like a common subgroup and you can do the same thing with a common subalgebra. Oh, okay, so this is like actually the co-product thing in groups, like G1, the yeah, Okay. Or this is covariant, another one would be covariant. Okay. Uh, I have an actual question. This is uh, the fundamental break. Um, uh, free product, yeah. Free product. Where, uh, Don't ask where me to define it. Properties of these written down. Because, like, I've had to read them a few times. If you don't know, just say fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, Pope is too unfactorable. Like, I think actually constructs the free products. I think Pope is too unfactorable. Like, I think actually constructs the free products. Okay, so it's in chapter. Is it 5.3 or 5.4? I can I can show you. I mean, I, I just I have a I have a literal physical copy. Yeah, I actually. Most of the time, hope that I don't actually use something very serious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, most times you just think of these as like two groups, and then you just think of it purely algebraically. It's like ah, the limits are probably fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So something that's important for von Neumann algebras is their representation theory. So, but. Instead of using G mod, you 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you use uh, von Neumann bi modules, and so but a bi so a G module um, is what people I guess maybe think of as a vector space with a group acting on the vector space. But I would think of it as a Hilbert space with a group acting on the Hilbert space. Okay, because I care about my inner prox. And it's, I want to be a unitary representation. It's really what I'm thinking of. Uh, right, so a bi module, again, is you have this Hilbert space, but your algebra acts on the left and the right. So you actually have two commuting actions at the, at the same time. And sort of the interplay between the two actions is, is quite important. Um, yeah, so there's a fancy way of saying this, which is that it's a represent, really a representation of. M tensor M op on H, which is, I think is a garbage definition. So I don't know why I wrote this down. <laughs> but you have a left action and a right action and they they commute with each other is the whole point. Okay. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of theory like blah, blah, blah. This is the correct analogy. So, okay. I'm still not even 100% convinced this is the correct analogy, but like, I, everyone says it is. So. Uh, right, so. Yeah, yeah, so this is a pretty bad rhyme, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> ah, all right. Okay. Let me fix the. Uh, fix the language. Yeah. So, whatever. I didn't. Uh, that's upsetting. Yeah. I used to be able to change the dictionary to, like, you know, Canadian, English, or whatever. Yeah. Anyway. Um, Right, so these two things are properties of groups, which you maybe haven't heard of, um, because every finite group has both of these properties, <laughs> which is upsetting maybe for, for the audience. Uh, however, these are like really natural um, properties to study for, for countable groups, because they say a lot about the dynamics of groups. So sort of, you know, like it's very natural to study group actions, right? Because groups act on themselves, they graph, and like, the whole point of studying groups is really to study group actions. And these are very natural properties of group actions for infinite groups. So they're saying something, some, some sort of limiting or some sort of infinitary property. Um, and actually, in a sense, they're both saying that the groups are, they're like finite groups, but they're saying it in very different ways. So amenability is saying that your group has the property that it's, uh, so in a finite group, right? If you have sort of, so if you have a finite group acting on a vector space, right? You can come up with a G invariant vector just by taking the orbit of some vector and then averaging, right? So immutable groups have sort of a similar property where you can get um, not necessarily invariant vectors, but almost invariant vectors. So things that are like very close to being invariant. Uh, property, property T is sort of the flip side of the coin where uh, it's not saying that you have almost invariant vectors. They're not saying if there are almost invariant vectors already, then there are actually invariant vectors. So for a finite group, there's always these invariant vectors, right? You just slowly just add them up the orbits. So property T isn't like that because you're not guaranteed the almost invariants to start off with. But once you have that, then you have invariant vectors. So if you have a group that has both properties, if you're immutable, you have almost invariant vectors. If property T, it lifts those to actually invariant vectors. And so put them together, you have to have a finite group. So that's the only way you can have like truly invariant vectors in your left regular representation. Caveat, 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 caveat. Um, okay. Yes. Oh, time? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, come thank me, Baki. Yeah, I didn't really plan out this part. I, just, <laughs> I was just planning for like the first 10 minutes. <laughs> This, this is all, as we call it in Louisiana, land nap. A little something extra. <laughs> all right, everyone, let us thank the speaker.